Greetings to all members of the human race. My name is Jared, and this is the Jared Show Knowledge Podcast. This week's episodes are going to be about current events with uh, Jacob Blake being shot last Sunday, and we're going to get into a little bit of the Black Lives Matters movement. Gentlemen, boys and girls, the J- 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 Jared, the Jared Show. Want to change the world? Welcome to the Jared Show Knowledge Podcast. Uh, yeah. I'm, I gotta be honest with you, I'm a little nervous to do this show. Um, yeah, I, you know, white guy talking about all these things uh, should be interesting, but um, I, I do feel like unless I'm capable of expressing uh, my opinions and bringing you, the audience, uh, facts and, and not pandering to uh, the mainstream narrative that has gone on on all these different things um i'm doing you a disservice and i'm doing myself a disservice so i I feel like even though this is a highly controversial uh couple of episodes just like last week's were um i feel like it's it's necessary uh you know and, and what's interesting is after last week and talking about the coronavirus i was actually hoping to uh lighten things up a bit um but then um, when episode uh, part one of coronavirus came out last on this last Sunday, um, yeah, that that came out and in, in about on that same day, about 5 p.m. in Wisconsin, um, there was another incident where Jacob Blake, um, another black male, uh, was shot by police officers in Kenosha, Wisconsin, on Sunday. And uh, things have erupted yet again. And I feel because of how things have progressed in our society, uh, within our culture, within the world, um, over the last, basically since the beginning of this year, I mean, really since February and March, um, that it was kind of only right to follow that timeline uh, within this podcast as well. And what I mean by that is, is really... Um, we're, we're going to dip into a lot of different things, uh, in this one and the next episode as well. But, um, really in March, we had two things happen at the same time. We had, uh, Breonna Taylor, the incident there, um, in Louisville, Kentucky. And then we also had coronavirus kind of come in and become this, this pandemic that we as, uh, Americans started having to deal with. Um, and then things started happening after that. And um, May 25th, you had George Floyd. Um, then we had Richard Brooks. And then I think the latest one is um, Jacob Blake. So I feel like I've addressed coronavirus. And then after that has kind of come full circle with Black Lives Matter. Um, movement now you know this this movement black lives matter has been around the group is, itself has been around since 2013 but i, I feel like this year especially it, um it has resurfaced a little bit more and i think there's a lot more attention it's kind of taken center stage um because a lot of people need something to divert their attention to um something other than coronavirus so because of that i feel like this is taking center stage a a bit more with the nba and the things that they're doing and and i think rightly so you know here's the thing black lives do matter and you know the black community is hurting they're suffering and and i think they need help um we're gonna get to all of that through this episode and the next one um this is gonna be kind of a double episode we're gonna treat this week as um, you know, addressing these these issues and these events. Um, 
I, I want to get into uh, the mainstream narrative and, and how we've been taught to look at all of these things that have happened so far. Um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, um, you know, Rashard Brooks, um, Jacob Blake. I, I want to get into the the deeper version of us versus them. I, I don't think I'm, I'm really quite ready to do that. I don't think we've gone... I don't think we know each other well enough to do that yet. But... Um, I think eventually, you know, we'll get into the real issue of what's really us versus them. I mean, is it, is it, you know, white people versus black people? Is it Democrat versus Republican? You know, these kind of things. We'll get into that. And, and I also, throughout both of these episodes, I want to get into the root of a problem I think, I think black people seem to be facing. Um, but I don't think it's, it's uh, localized or specialized. And, and set aside just for black people. I think it's something that we as society are, are facing. Um, and I think it's a problem that that within the black community and, and within society at large that I think we are all facing. Um, and, and I want to jump into some of those things. So bear with me. I'm, I am a little nervous. I have a feeling that at some point uh, this episode in my opinions and the facts that I'm presenting and these kind of things are not going to be well received especially in a, in a cancer culture but um cancel culture uh, we'll see how it goes though uh, I'm, I'm willing to kind of stand up and say these things um you know if people don't like that you can email me at um the jared show knowledge podcast at gmail if you'd like and tell me how wrong I am. You can tweet me at the Jared Show. Um, yeah, you can leave comments on this video on YouTube if you like. Um, I'm more than willing to listen to what you have to say, um, and I and I hope you're willing to listen to what I have to say as well. So stick around. Uh, we're gonna dive into it when we get back. Hello, Jared here. Due to the content of this episode, I decided that instead of having a funny commercial, I'd give you a minute to think. Make your own decisions and form your own opinions. now back to the show welcome back to the jared show knowledge podcast uh in this episode um let's first address what's happened this year some of the big incidents that have happened this year and uh, we're going to take a look at those incidents and how they have played out um let's begin with brianna taylor the incident that happened in march of this year 2020 um so let's get a little uh, the official story, that kind of thing. So basically what happened is on March 13th, 2020, 26-year-old Brianna Taylor was shot and killed by police officers executing a no-knock search warrant. Three plainclothed Louisville Metro police officers. This happened in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they used a battering ram to burst into her apartment shortly after midnight. Brianna Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, who was licensed to carry a firearm, fired first, hitting a police officer in the leg, and then three officers responded by opening fire, firing 20 rounds and hitting Brianna Taylor up to eight times, causing her to be pronounced dead at the scene. So uh, that's what we know. Um, those are facts. Every single bit of that is facts. That's no speculation or conjecture. That's exactly what happened. Um, let, let's get a little bit more into things. Um, 
what what were the cops doing there? Uh, they were there to um, exercise a search warrant, execute a search warrant. Uh, there was strong evidence that Brianna Taylor and her boyfriend were friends and possibly actually accomplices helping a well-known drug dealer that lived about 10 miles away. The police had reason to believe that the two were helping the drug dealer because of suspicious, suspicious activity. Uh, Brianna Taylor's car had been parked out in front of the drug dealer's house. Uh, the drug dealer had been spotted uh, earlier in the year, in January, um, receiving a USPS package before leaving and driving to a known drug dealer's house. So basically, I think the police had very good reason. I mean, in order to get a search warrant from a judge, you have to present uh, probable cause in order to do that. Um, so I think they had very good reason to suspect that Brianna Taylor and Kenneth Walker, or one or the other, were working for or with uh, these drug dealers. So the police executed a search warrant, bust in, they received gunfire back, um, and fired back because of that gunfire. Um, it is a fact that Kenneth Walker fired first. It is a fact that the police obtained a search warrant to search the resident for any drugs or drug-related things. Uh, as I said, obtaining a, a search warrant means that you provide probable cause to a judge. Um, so if we look at the evidence as presented, what can we make of this particular incident? Now, it's speculation that the cops said something as they were hitting the door, that they knocked, that they had any kind of communication with Kenneth, Wa Kenneth Walker. Um, it's speculation that Kenneth Walker thought that they were, um, you know, people trying to assault him in his own house. I think all of that is, is speculation. And um, anybody can say that. Anybody can say anything. What we have to do is we have to go, I think, on the evidence of what's going on. Um, you know, the, the fact that three cops in plain clothes um, entered their house with a no-knock search warrant. Now, I think we've all seen in many different shows, many movies, um, throughout life, I think we it's, it's a fact that we accept that cops executing a drug search warrant are usually not uh that are usually trying to be inconspicuous you know i think we've seen that where the cop is is wearing plain clothes he has the the badge around on a necklace or whatever on a chain um you know so that he can show when he's doing what he does but he's not in plain clothes so as not to uh tip off anybody as they're trying to execute this search warrant they're also trying to execute this search warrant at a time of day where um, it's inconvenient for the people that they're doing it to. Um, you know, I think as they entered the apartment, you know, they had a no-knock search warrant. We've seen, we've all seen this before in many different videos, movies, TV shows, all of these things where, you know, they don't want to tip anybody off. Um, and it's, it's actually, you know, the speculation goes back and forth. You know, the speculation, Kenneth Walker, nobody ever said anything. He thought people were coming to, you know, kill him or hurt him. And the cops said something, and he responded, and they told him what was going on. Um, it's it's a you know one versus one argument there. Um, what we do know is that when the cops entered the apartment, they were fired on. One cop was injured, um, and the cops fired back. You know, I think at the end of the day with this one, I think it's a tragedy that Brianna Taylor died. Um, but I'm, I'm really not sure, given the facts here, that I see that what the police officers were doing was anything more than what we as the general public have expected out of them. You know, And, and I know this is a, a very unpopular opinion, and I'm going to be stating quite a few unpopular opinions uh, in this episode and probably the next one. Um, you know, I look at it, I try to be as objective with all these things as I possibly can, and um, it's hard to do, you know, when, when you look at these things, you know, you look at the, the videos from George Floyd and Richard Brooks and, um, Jacob Blake and, you know, there's no video for Breonna Taylor that I've, I know of, but when you look at these videos, it, it creates that emotion in you. But if you look at these things, 
um, without that emotion, without a narrative telling you what to think and what to believe and what to be looking out for and what to, how to interpret information. I think when you look at a lot of these things, um, there's really only one incident that's really going to stand out. We're going to get into that in a minute, but um, you know, I, I think we all know about how cops do their jobs. You know, the fact that they are in plain clothes, they're trying to serve a search warrant, they're not tipping off the suspect, they're going in, you know, and if that suspect fires on them, they have been, somebody's been shot, they're going to fire back. Um, I think that's just, uh, you know, a fact in life. I think the, the problem here is that it ended in tragedy, um, that they never found any drugs, as far as I've seen, um, even to this day. Um but I think, you know, from what I understand, I mean, obviously they had to get a search warrant from a judge. So therefore it had to be, um, you know, something to that. So, you know, there had to be a reason for that. And, and I think from what we've seen and what we've heard, you know, very good reasons. So, um, Anyway, in, in this incident, like I said, I, I'm not sure that I can say the cops were really in the wrong here. Um, and, and that's kind of where I stand with that. You know, I think it's a tragedy that Breonna Taylor, who seemed like a, a good person, um, died for seemingly no reason. But I think if you examine the evidence, you zoom out and don't have emotion get in the way or a particular um, narrative tell you what to think about it I think if you look at it for what it is um, it's kind of routine unfortunately you know the fact that the guy fired on the cops um, is unfortunate and you know the cops are doing their job but I, I think you know like I said it's an unpopular opinion I'm gonna be stating many unpopular opinions especially when it gets to um, the last two with Richard uh, Brooks and, and Jacob Blake but Right now I want to move to the next incident, uh, which I think is, is interesting in so many different ways. And I think, you know, let, let's get into George Floyd. So uh, this incident really is a clear abuse of power and a clear homicide by a police officer. Um, but I think I have a different perspective on it. Um, things seem a bit odd in this situation. I'm going to go over some of that. I'm not going to go over everything I think about this incident as uh, much of my thoughts on it are really pure speculation, I, I must say. Um, I, I think I will say that the facts paint a different picture, maybe a darker picture here. Um, so I, I think I'm trying not to speculate on this. I, I do want to bring up some things that I think are odd in this situation, but I will say first and foremost um, that the killing of the homicide, the murder of George Floyd in front of everyone was completely unjustified. A little bit scary um, that that cops are, can get away with those things. But again, let's let's zoom out and and try not to look at things in with that perspective. Okay, um, so let's go over some facts real quick, uh, and then we're gonna. Um, kind of dive into things. So on May 25th, 2020 of this year, George Floyd was killed by Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, here's the thing. If you have not watched the timeline of this event and how uh, these things played out, I will leave a link in the description so that you can go and view it for yourself um, so that you can form your own opinions on this. But I do warn you that uh, what you will see in that particular thing, especially uh, the last bit where George Floyd dies, is um, quite graphic. It's, it's pretty uh, heartbreaking, and it's, it's definitely not for the faint of heart, so um, be warned. Um, but basically, the incident goes like this. I've seen it many times. Um, and especially the, the, the first... A uh, couple of minutes, the first, how things progressed. You know, I, I try not to watch over and over the um, the passed out man that George Floyd is at that particular time. But um, 
so like I said, I've seen it many different times. The timeline stitched together of all these different cameras that were around that area. So it goes something like this. So George Floyd and several other people go into a convenience store. Uh, the store owners, so they buy cigarettes, they come back out, they get back in their car. The store owners call the cops because of suspected counterfeit bills. The police arrive shortly thereafter, at, uh, get to the scene. They get uh, George Floyd out of his vehicle. Um, after having drawn their gun, they, the police officer holsters his, his gun again, gets uh, George Floyd out of the vehicle, places him in handcuffs, walks him across the street to put him in the back of a police cruiser to take him to jail. Um, officer... Chauvin, Derek Chauvin, arrives just as Floyd has been put in the vehicle. Chauvin goes to the other side of the police cruiser, drags him out of the vehicle. Two more cops join in to pin George Floyd down to the ground. As things progress, Officer Chauvin, Derek Chauvin, proceeds to put his, neck, his knee on George Floyd's neck for up to eight minutes, causing Floyd to lose consciousness and to be loaded into an ambulance where he died of cardiac arrest. Um, it was determined, I, th I think, from what I've seen, that it was asphyxiation at cardiac arrest um, through the, um, the autopsies that were done. Um, but he dies at 9.25 on that day. Here's, here's the, the interesting things that I think are, are, are really just kind of odd. Um, really, it's only a couple. I, I'm only going to go into And like I said, a lot of this is speculation. I don't know what this means. I, I'm not saying... I, I'm not really drawing any conclusions here. Um, what I am going to do is point out some things that were weird. Okay? Uh, so first and foremost, I, I do want to say this, though. Uh, the situation I just described, where Chauvin causes the death of George Floyd, is horrible. It is absolutely wrong and should not be tolerated. No man deserves to die that way. Anyone, for any reason, no matter their background or anything that's going on. Um, what you witness on those videos, if you take everything at face value, um, is absolutely horrific. And... George Floyd, no one else deserves to die that way. Uh, I also think that this incident scared a lot of people. Um, watching what seems like a blatant homicide, murder, by those that are sworn to serve and protect us, I think was disturbing and scary. Um, especially since all of these people are around and just watching this happen helplessly. Um, here are some of the facts that I think are interesting, uh, perhaps even odd, though. For one, George Floyd knew Derek Chauvin. As a matter of fact, they worked together as bouncers at a club. They had history with each other, altercations and incidents. It's reported that Chauvin and Floyd frequently worked as security guards at a club within the past year. So we're talking about 2019. These men were working together. As a matter of fact, it said that they both were scheduled to work the same Tuesday nights by the club owner, is, is the one that said this. Another former em, uh, employee of the club that was a co-worker of both of them said, quote, the two men had a history. They knew each other pretty well. They bumped heads. It was had it has a lot to do with Chauvin being extremely aggressive within the club with some of the patrons, which was an issue, end quote. Okay, so they knew each other very well, pretty well, is what it's the quote is. I think the interesting part here is as you watch this video and as things are progressing and everything's going on, okay. Neither one of those two people, okay, these are people that have had altercations, know each other very well, have worked together ever on these Tuesday nights less than a year ago, okay, and they never 
acknowledge one another in the videos. Ever. Not once do they acknowledge each other. As in, say, for instance, Chavin or Derek or Floyd or George. There's no acknowledgement between those two men towards each other. Even though they know each other, they've worked together. I think it's it's we I think that in itself is strange. And and here's the other thing that goes along with that. I'm not sure about you, but me personally, if I knew someone pretty well and I'd had run-ins with this person before, and I had problems with someone like that, and I'm in a situation like George Floyd was. I think it's interesting that he never appeals to that past relationship. Or in those circumstances, I would think those guys would acknowledge each other in some point or some way, but it never happened. Now, the way I want to explain this is if you're fighting for your life, okay? Now, I've listened to what George Floyd is saying as he's, I've listened to that tape, I've listened to what's going on, the ambulance, the whole deal of what is going on in that scenario. George Floyd never acknowledges Derek Chauvin. He never calls him out by name. He, even though there's people surrounding him and videotaping him, he never calls out to those people for help. Even though he, he claims many times he's going to die, he ends up calling out to his mom, which there's no way that his mom can hear him or help him or any of these things. I know for me personally, if I'm in that situation, I'm going to appeal to one of two things in that situation. One is the people that are around me. If I really feel like my life is in danger and I'm going to die, then I'm going to appeal to the people around me. Please help me get this guy off of my neck. Now, I, as far as I remember and I've seen, Floyd doesn't do that. He calls out to his mom instead of the people that can actually help him in that situation. Here's the other thing. If I'm in that situation and the guy I know that I've worked with has his knee on my neck, I'm going to address him personally. I'm going to say, Derek, get your knee off my neck. I'm going to say, Chauvin, what's the deal? Chauvin, help me. I'm going to address, I'm going to make it a personal issue so that it's not me versus them. It's Derek knows who I am, right? And I know who Derek is. And even though we've had a personal conflict, a personal beef, I'm still going to appeal to that personal relationship and call him out by name. That never happens throughout this entire incident, which I think is very weird. I, I'm not telling you why. I don't know why. I just think it's very odd. Here's number two. Here's the other thing that I think is, is interesting, and it's, it's again, odd. Uh, I think it's interesting how, it's, and weird is how and where George Floyd died. Now, like I said, I've listened to all these things. I've read a bunch of news reports. There's a wiki, Wikipedia uh, thing, channel, or, or page on this. The death of George Floyd. You can go check it out. Kind of runs you through the timeline of everything. Um, but I've seen it. I've, I've read the all of those things, read articles, and I think it's it's odd the time frame and what was going on surrounding his death, how he died. So going into that time frame, you say he was loaded into the ambulance at 8:29. Okay, so what we see is George Floyd is passed out. He's not dead yet. Okay, so George Floyd is not dead. When you see that video, you understand at 829, he's still alive when he gets loaded into that ambulance. He dies at 925. So he's not dead yet, right? He didn't die on the scene, right? So he gets loaded into an ambulance at 829. And the events leading that, that proceed from this are really weird. Um, what's, what, what goes on from there? So at 829, he's loading the ambulance. The ambulance 
starts to head towards the hospital. And the paramedics require or request a fire truck, which I don't understand that. I, I don't understand why paramedics need a fire truck. I mean, I guess in order to clear traffic, but is that like, aren't you like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't the fire truck meet you on this? I don't, I don't understand this, this confusion that happens between the operators, the dispatch, between the fire trucks, between the police and between the paramedics. As far as I understand, Minneapolis, Minnesota is a pretty big city. These people have probably done this for years. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I'm willing to give those people the benefit of the doubt that they're not stupid, they know how to do their jobs. The thing I don't understand is how come the fire truck is not meeting the ambulance at the same time, okay? Let's say, okay, the fire truck is um, having trouble, da da da, right? Why is it that the paramedics, first of all, are requesting a fire truck, Second of all, have not requested a fire truck until they get to the scene. Right? I don't understand the timeline of how this plays out. Let's keep going within that timeline. Uh, so he's loaded into the ambulance at 829. At 832, which is approximately three minutes later, the fire truck gets to the scene. The ambulance is already taken off. So why did the am okay, so the ambulance asks, we need a fire truck. The ambulance says that and takes off towards the hospital, knowing that they need, they wanted, they requested a fire truck. The fire truck shows up on the scene, which the ambulance has already left, three minutes, just three minutes, not even. I mean, how long does it take to load somebody in an ambulance? Probably, I don't know, 15 seconds, 30, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So he's loaded in, they leave two, three minutes before the fire truck gets there, which is weird, right? But, you know, apparently there it's an emergency. You got to go. You got to get this man to the hospital. It makes sense, right? So the fire truck gets to the scene at 832. They get to the scene. Ambulance has already left for the hospital. The fire trucks are talking to the cops at the scene trying to figure out where the ambulance went. And again, I don't, I don't understand. Do you, do you not know how to use a radio? How is it that... You can't, you're not on the radio talking to the ambulance drivers as all of this is going on. I don't understand that, right? Why are the firemen asking the policemen where the ambulance has gone instead of asking the paramedics where they are? And then it gets into this whole thing where the dispatch is the one that's talking to all of these people, which is weird. I don't understand why the paramedics can't talk to the firemen. Why is that? Right? Like we live in a technology age right now where I can talk to anybody. I can talk to somebody in the middle of China. I can FaceTime and see somebody in the middle of China. And you're telling me that paramedics and firefighters don't have a, a communication between each other. They have to go through a dispatch. And in the middle of all this, as you watch what's going on in the dispatch, the firemen come back to the dispatch ask them what the deal is the dispatch comes back to the policeman tells them hey tell them where the ambulance went the policeman tell the dispatch we don't know where the ambulance went the dispatch talks to the paramedics and this is where things get even weirder the paramedics report at this same time about the same time that on the radio i assume to the dispatch obviously not to the fire trucks, I guess they can't talk to each other, that Floyd has gone into cardiac arrest and ask the fire truck through the dispatch to meet them on the corner of 36th Street and Park Avenue. Here's the timeline as it goes through. This is where things get really crazy. Five minutes later, the fire truck gets to the ambulance. Two fire department medics board the ambulance and say they found George Floyd unresponsive and pulseless. Crazy. It's crazy. So let me get this straight. The ambulance is at the scene. They leave to go to the hospital because it's such an emergency. They're in such a hurry. The fire trucks get to the scene three minutes later. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what's going on. 
And then the ambulance, I guess, just stops on the corner of 36th Street and Park Ave. And they meet up five minutes later. So now that's a total, that's a wasted time of eight minutes right there. While this man is, as they say, gone into cardiac arrest. Okay, so many things don't add up here. For one, why does the ab- ambulance absolutely need a fire truck to get to the hospital? Obviously, they didn't need an ambulance. They had requested an a-, a fire truck and took off anyway. Why is the fire truck asking the cops where the ambulances are? Where the ambulance is? I mean, why aren't the firemen and the paramedics talking to each other on a radio? Again, we live in. I can I can talk to somebody. I got an Apple Watch on right now. I can talk to somebody with my watch that lives all the way on the other on the other end of the globe or the other end of the earth right i can talk to somebody right now in china in japan in in california right now and you're telling me that these firemen and paramedics can't talk to each other in the middle of a crisis in the middle of an emergency they have to go through a dispatch are you kidding me Here's the other thing. Why does the ambulance, knowing that that George Floyd has gone into cardiac arrest, wait five minutes for the fire trucks? Something about the whole George Floyd incident seems a bit off to me. It really does. Um, You know, the fact that these people, and and there's a lot of things. You know, I don't, I don't it, like I said, these things are speculation. I think it's odd and, in, and interesting. I don't have any conclusions to draw from this. I think it's weird, though. I don't know what that means, right? That George Floyd and Chauvin never addressed each other, even though they're in this life and death situation, even though they're dealing with this. Floyd never addresses the crowd that's gathered to watch this. He never addresses the guy that's pinning him even though he knows who he is it's not like they didn't know each other they just worked together last year you're telling me that they completely forgot about who each other was even though they'd had a i mean i don't know about you but if i had a problem with somebody that i worked with a you know a few incidents knew each other pretty well as a co-worker said chances are when i see that person again Chances are I'm going to remember who they are. I may not remember, you know, somebody I never talked to or somebody I just casually worked with. But you have the the owner of the club said they worked on the same days, Tuesdays. You have a co-worker that said that they knew each other pretty well, had altercations and incidents with each other. And gave the reason. Because Chauvin was, you know, Mr. Macho or whatever the case may be. And you're telling me that throughout this entire incident that they never acknowledge you? I don't know what that means. I don't know why they don't acknowledge. I think it's weird, though. I think it's very weird. I think it's weird the circus clown, you know, episode of the ambulance and the fire truck trying to get together. I mean, you telling me in 2020 that an ambulance and a fireman can't talk to each other on a radio? They have to go through a dispatch? I think that's weird and ridiculous odd you know here's the thing when you look at the consequences and reaction to this situation how in the middle of a pandemic just when things are seemingly starting to settle into place and people have a little bit of money in the bank here comes protests and march marches riots looting division hatred and one of the stupidest ideas i have ever heard that of getting rid of police officers altogether. Really. That's what you that's your solution is getting rid of okay. All right. I'm getting a little heated here, right? Um, because I think this is weird. And and by the time I get around to Richard uh, Brooks and, and Jacob Evan or Jacob Blake, um, I'm probably gonna get more heated. So I warn you. Um, this stuff is ridiculous to me, you know? Yeah. Like I said, we, I don't know what happened. I know what I've seen when it comes to George Floyd. I'm not sure what I believe when it comes to that. I think it's weird. I think it's weird that you would pass a counterfeit bill and hang around and wait for the police to show up. I think that's strange. 
You know, I think there's a lot of odd things around the whole George Floyd thing. I think the fact that George Floyd knew some people that were famous, um, knew the guy that killed him. I think I think a lot of that's a little odd. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there though. I'm getting really speculative. It's called the Knowledge Podcast. I'm not trying to be all. You know, I'm willing to have opinions, but you know, when those opinions are just speculation, it's probably better I don't go in that direction. But um, yeah, I look at the consequences. I, I look at the consequences of um, what happened because of George Floyd dying. You know, people getting scared, riots, protesting, looting, division, hatred. Um, yeah, it's strange. I, I'm, I'm going to get into that a little bit more, um, I think, in the next episode. This grand idea, we should get rid of the cops. I'm going to get into that next episode. But um, right now, let's let's get back to the next two incidents. Rashard Brooks and uh, the most recent one, uh, Jacob Blake. And uh, we'll be we'll be right back after this. Hello, Jared here. Due to the content of this episode, I decided that instead of having a funny commercial, I'd give you a minute to think. Enjoy the music and take this minute to think about all of the things I've said so far and everything you've seen or heard about the subject matter everywhere else. In the news, YouTube and social media, friends, family, teachers, music, movies, and more. Make your own decisions and form your own opinions. back to the Jared Show Knowledge Podcast. Are you still listening? Uh, I'm interested. Yeah, um, this is some heavy-duty stuff, man. You know, I'm, I'm kind of going in on some things and, and um, saying things that people are probably not going to like. Uh, that happens, you know. That's, it's going to happen. If all I did was pander to you and say, oh, you know, these people, and uh, uh, you know, I don't need to have my own show. There's enough people doing that already. I think, you know, from what I've seen, this mainstream narrative is very weird that nobody else is saying these things that I'm about to say. So buckle up. Uh, let's get into it. Let's get into what happened to Rashard Brooks. Um, again, uh, if you have not seen uh, the video of this incident, I recommend that you view it before you form any kind of opinion uh, about the incident with Rashard Brooks. Um, I have seen it, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Let me explain. Basically, Richard Brooks was shot and killed near Atlanta, Georgia on June 12, 2020. Uh, like I said, you know, I have watched this entire video. It's about 45 minutes long. Uh, I've watched it, uh, I think, a couple of times. And, and it impacted me so much. And then I went and read uh, the comments below it. Um, and, and I just read so many comments that I just disagreed with. I said, you know, I have a voice, um, and, and I can write, and I want to put this out there and, and see what happens and see if people read it and see if they agree or disagree or um, maybe even change some people's minds. And so I actually left a comment on the video, and I'm going to leave a link to the video that I'm talking about in the description and uh you know i'm sure if you scroll down a million comments down somewhere i'm buried down in there somewhere um but i'll leave a link to the description so you can see the video that i'm talking about um and that i left a comment on you can see it for yourself and like i said form your own opinion um but basically here's what i wrote it's, it's based on my own perception and perspective after having watched this video um, and, and a couple others actually as well um, there's a couple of different videos that are this but this is the whole incident it's about 45 minutes long 
Um, and, and I will tell you this right now. This is the Jared Show Knowledge Podcast, but um, I, I do not pre- uh, present what I'm about to read or what I wrote as facts, okay? The, they are merely a theory based on the facts, okay? So I, I'm, I'm looking and trying to be as objective as I can of what's going on. And really, I, I formulated a theory, you know, I formulated something and I was like, you know, this sounds a lot like this. And so, um, and, and this is going to get deep. All right. So bear with me here. Um, I'm just going to read this whole statement. I'm just going to read the comment itself just straight out. And uh, I might jump into it. And like I said, I might get a little heated with these next two because I, I think the mainstream narrative of, of uplifting these guys and, and circling around and this kind of, I think has become ridiculous. And, um, you know, if you're still listening, I appreciate it. Um, if nobody's listening, then so be it. Oh, well, but here's what I wrote. Um, based on Mr. Brooks, may he rest in peace statements. I have a theory piecing his testimony together. Was he there or just visiting? And by testimony, I need to interject here real quick. Um, By testimony, I mean the things that he was telling the cops in the 45 minutes or 40 minutes before, you know, all hell broke loose with with everything. Piecing his testimony together, what he is explaining to the cops is very, it's all over the place if you watch the video. Um, But here's the questions I got out of it, right? Which, uh, was he there or just visiting was he from there or was he just visiting uh he said at a birthday party for my daughter um around him was it a baby mama or a girlfriend or i mean he kind of jumps around a lot um then it says going home or going to a hotel right he says i'm staying at a hotel two minutes away and then minutes later he says, I can go to my house just a couple of blocks away. And then minutes later, he says, I can go to my sister's house just a couple of blocks away. All right? So what, 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 which one is it? Are you staying in a hotel? Are you staying with your sister? Are you staying at your own house? A lot of things of what he's saying just don't add up. And I think what it is is he's just saying whatever he is coming to mind, any lie that he can do to get out of the situation. Um... And, and some of the things that don't add up is rental car, hotel, girl waiting for him at a hotel. He says that. My girlfriend's waiting for me at the hotel. It's just a couple blocks away. And then he has a baby mama at the party, at the birthday party, and gives her money for the birthday party. Right? So this is the theory as, as you listen to what he's saying and you start adding all these things up of what he's saying. Right? This is my theory. And... Um, I mean no disrespect to this the deceased, uh, Mr. Mr. Brooks. May Mr. Brooks rest in peace um, until God judges him, not me. Um, like I said, you know, I listened to this. I used a critical thinking mind, and I came up with this idea. I think he may or may not have been cheating on his baby mama with a girl at a hotel. He was trying his best to get out of this situation knowing he couldn't go to jail because if he did, he would have some explaining to do to the baby mama. So he was trying everything he could, saying whatever came to mind to leave that situation, to get out of that situation. And I think he misread the cops and felt if he just kept talking, they would let him go. But the more he kept talking, the more it was obvious He was drunk, and there was no way the cops would let him go. You can see the look on his face. When you watch this video, I'm interjecting here, but when you watch this video, you can see the look on his face. Back to the comment. You can see the look on on his face as the officer goes to get the breath test. It looks like he is debating how he will explain all of this to someone later. So when the officer asks him, and they're really polite with each other throughout the entire thing until the very last moment. And the officer asks him, you know, 
would you mind if you, if, if you took a breath test? Would you take a breath test? And you can tell he's like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Right? And then when the officer leaves, the other officer is still standing there. And you can see the look on Rashard Brooks' face. Like he's trying to figure out what he's going to say to baby mama or the girl at the hotel or somebody. You can tell he's trying to figure out how am I going to spin this. Right? And I think what happens is once the officer tried to put the cuffs on him, he makes that decision. He makes the decision, I can't go to jail. This will ruin my life. And I won't be able to explain this situation to whoever it is. Baby mama, girl at the hotel, whoever it may be. He won't be able to explain this situation. And like I said, it's a theory. It may be a bad one. I don't know probably enough information to even bring up a theory. But the more that you, you listen to what he's saying... And how he's just lying. He's just saying whatever comes to mind so that the cops will let him go. Um, I think he makes that decision of no way. I'm, am I going to jail? I won't be able to explain this. When those cops get put on him. I think he makes that decision. And I think um, he, he made the decision. It's, you know, he, he would do whatever it takes to get out of that situation. Um, and unfortunately, he made the decision for the cops as well here's a rundown and and this is um, again i'm reading from uh the the comment i made it says he resists arrest assaults two officers in the process he steals a deadly weapon according to the precedent set in the state of georgia and atlanta a taser is a deadly weapon which he stole he attempts to fi- flee the scene with a deadly weapon the officer fires his taser at Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks continues to flee. While attempting to flee the scene, he, Mr. Brooks turns around, fires the weapon at police. Information I actually obtained from another video, other footage you can see. In this one, you can't see that. Um, if you go look at other footage, um, you can see this. Uh, the police use deadly force in order to stop a drunk and disorderly man who has already assaulted two officers, attempted to injure officers with a deadly weapon in a crowded area. Right, they're out of Wendy's. Right? Like I said, go watch the video, you see what I'm saying. Here's the bottom line. Uh, we can play Monday morning quarterback or be a backseat driver given all the facts of what Mr. Brooks did, as in past tense. In the moment, however, no one knows what Mr. Brooks is capable of after he has resisted arrest, assaulted two police officers, stolen a deadly weapon, discharged that deadly weapon at officers while attempting to flee the scene. We have to remember that police officers are there to protect and serve everyone. They must neutralize any and all threats to the public at that moment. They cannot allow him to get away. They cannot allow him to harm anyone else on the scene. They can only allow the situation, they cannot allow the situation to escalate further. Think about it this way. After Mr. Brooks has proven that he is willing to do whatever it takes to get away, including assaulting officers, stealing a deadly weapon, and discharging that deadly weapon, what makes anyone think this man isn't capable of carjacking someone in line at the Wendy's. What makes anyone think he isn't capable of causing anyone else harm at that point? I think Mr. Brooks was impaired. I think the officers did their duty, followed the law, did their best to handle the situation, and ultimately, it was Mr. Brooks that forced their hand. Mr. Brooks, in a moment of bad judgment, resisted arrest, resulting in an assault, on two police officers in the process, stole a deadly weapon, attempted to flee the scene with that deadly weapon, discharged that weapon at officers, chasing him, and was shot in the process. And this is all in capitals. It is a shame that Mr. Brooks was killed. I mourn the loss of another human being. And I'm sorry for this man's family. I'm sorry that this man has to go through this in such a public way. I'm sorry that his family, once this is all over, will have to remember and be remembered for this incident. I'm sorry that his kids will have to grow up without a dad. I am sorry that his kids 
will have to mourn the loss of their dad every year so close to dad's day. Yeah, this sucks. Truly, I do not know what Mr. Brooks was thinking. There is no way for me to know that information. I have put forth a theory here, but it's just that, a theory. Speculation. I'm not saying Mr. Brooks is a bad man. I'm not even saying that he got what he deserved. What I am saying is, the officers did what needed to be done. Stop a drunk, dangerous man from harming himself or anyone, or anyone else by any means necessary. But we as society don't have to let or make it get worse. We can all calmly and rationally review as much evidence as possible, make a decision based on that evidence, and decide what to do next. Two more things. One, what should the officers have done in this situation? Let him get away? What would you do if you are the police officer in that situation? Two, let's say we get rid of all cops or we lessen the funding so there are less cops on the streets. Would you really want to drive on the same streets as this man that's obviously drunk? I'll add that in there. Would you really want to be working at that Wendy's and have no one to call to deal with this situation? Because of what's going on around us and the overwhelming evidence of prejudice against certain ethnicities, not racism, for we are all part of the same race, the human race, because of the recent events of unjust, heinous, and cowardly actions from a select chosen few, violent action is taking place. We will never know the answer to the second part of the second question. Would you really want to be working at that Wendy's? Because that Wendy's was burned to the ground. We are a society, we as a society, need to have a sit down and sort all of this out. Burning a Wendy's down doesn't solve anything. In order to get justice, we have to look at it judiciously. Judiciously, sorry. In order to keep and maintain law and order, we have to abide by the law and conduct ourselves within the parameters of what we as society have deemed to be order. Mr. Brooks didn't deserve to die, but he made that choice. Those officers don't deserve to be imprisoned or die, and we the people have that choice. I hope we choose wisely. Now, I left this comment on uh, this video that I'm going to leave the description in the link. Um, this comment um, has received no response, either uh, against or for what I said. And while I am not the judge, jury, or executioner for these cops, I do think they did nothing wrong. Having said all of this, when we uh, before I, before I say that though, actually, I want to I want to say that um, the book got thrown at these guys. These guys were kicked off the force. I think the actual police officer that shot and killed Rashard Brooks, I think, went to jail. Um, let me know if I'm wrong about that. But um, unfortunately, the cops had to pay a consequence I don't think they deserved. Um, and we haven't even got into um, the thing that happened in Kenosha. When we get back, we're going to take a look at the most recent events that happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin on Sunday. Hello, Jared here. Due to the content of this episode, I decided that instead of having a funny commercial, I'd give you a minute to think. Enjoy the music, and take this minute to think about all of the things I've said so far, and everything you've seen or heard about the subject matter everywhere else. In the news, YouTube, and social media, friends, family, teachers, music, movies, and more. Make your own decisions, and form your own opinions. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Jared Show Knowledge Podcast. Um, thank you for listening. 
uh, on whatever platform you get your podcast from, whether it be iTunes or Spotify or Pocket Cast. There's many, many more that I'm on. And, and thank you for watching if you're watching this on uh, YouTube. Um, I, I really appreciate it. You may not agree with everything that I'm saying, uh, but thank you for listening. Um, I appreciate that. Like I said, if, if you want to contact me in any way, you think I'm completely wrong, I'm right, or I'm somewhere in between, let me know. Uh, you can you can email me at the Jared Show uh, Knowledge Podcast at Gmail. There's a link in the description in case you didn't catch all that. Um, you can tweet me at the Jared Show. Um, you know, just leave a comment on the video if you're watching the video. Um, I have no problems with that. I'm I'm more than willing to um, try and respond to every single one of them. So let me know. Uh, I think it's time we moved on to. The most recent incident, Jacob Blake, um, happened on Sunday, uh, last Sunday. Uh, here's everything that we know so far. Again, if you've not seen uh, this news or any of the videos of this, I'll leave a link in the description so you can take a look at it and, uh, and hopefully form your own opinion and not go in the way of the mainstream narrative. Um, but here's what I've seen. This is the information that I know. Um, by the time this you're hearing this, it, it may have changed. Things change very quickly. Um, I'm going off of what I know right now. Okay. Uh, so around 5 p.m. Sunday night, August 23rd, police officers responded to a domestic incident in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It is reported that officers were called to the address of a woman who claimed that, quote, her boyfriend was present and was not supposed to be on the premises, end quote. Because of the active arrest warrant out against Mr. Blake due to charges of sexual assault, trespassing, and disorderly conduct, the officers attempted to arrest Jacob Blake, which he resisted. In the latest video to come out, it's seen that, or the latest at this particular time, uh, from the passenger side of things, uh, it's seen that there is a scuffle with police officers on the passenger side of the car. Now, Blake somehow gets free from the officers. The officers draw their weapons and tell him to get on the ground. He proceeds to walk around the front of the car to the driver's side door, open the door, and lean forward into the car. At which point, Officer Rustin Shesky grabs the shirt of Mr. Blake in an attempt to keep him from getting in the car. Blake continues to resist leaning more into the car for an unknown reason whereupon officer Russian Sesky shoots Blake in the back seven times Blake falls to the ground officers call paramedics paramedics arrive rather quickly take him to a waiting helicopter where he is rushed to a nearby hospital he survives as far as I know right now um, but the altercation uh, is thought to be he is thought to be in danger of having, uh, of being paralyzed from the waist down, among m probably many other potential complications. Um, and God willing, he will live. God willing, he will still walk, and he will um, be able to hopefully get back to being a productive member of society. So let's look at the situation, okay? And we're going to get deep on this, and you may not agree with me. Um, and that's okay. That's fine. That's so be it. You know, we're we're trying to look at these facts from what they are, and uh, we're gonna do something I think a little bit different. Okay, we're not gonna jump to conclusions. We're gonna look at it from the perspective of the officers and the things that they have to deal with, and from the the perpetrator. But at the at the end of the day, we have to look at the evidence of what we're seeing and what's been told to us okay so let's look at this situation a man with a warrant out for his arrest shows up to a house where he is not supposed to be the cops get called and show up to handle this situation they attempt to arrest him because of said warrant he resists fights officers off of him as he's resisting uh, including a missed taser shot uh, fire that was fired walks around the vehicle opens the driver's side door all of this while three to four officers have their guns drawn on him 
One more bit of news is that Mr. Blake stated that he had a knife. Witnesses actually heard the officers yell, drop the knife, before gunfire erupted, and a knife was found in the front of the driver's side floorboard. Now here's the thing we don't know. We don't know if the officers know if if he stated that he had a knife. So when they when an officer pats you down, I've been patted down a couple of times. When an officer pats you down, right? Hands against the car, you know, legs spread apart, they pat you down, they ask you, do you have any weapons on you? If you say yes, right, then they're alerted to that. And they try to figure out where that weapon is. When you watch the video, you come in on the scuffle. You come in right as the scuffle is ending between Jacob Blake and two officers. Okay? So now he's gotten up. And as far as we know right now, I have to assume that those cops know that he either has a weapon on his person or in his car. They act, if you watch that video, they act as if he has a weapon on his person. And the reason I say that is because nobody tries to, nobody attempts to take him down to the ground again. Instead, now they have guns drawn. Right? So now they have guns drawn on a man that basically has said that he has a weapon and he is not complying with what they're saying. And as a last ditch effort, right? He, when he opens that door, they have to react to that. Before that, they don't have to react. They can keep saying, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. Instead of having to deal with the fact that maybe he does have a knife on his person, he's going to stab somebody, right? So they have guns drawn on you. But once he opens that door, the cops have to react to that situation. They cannot allow him to go into a car and leave. They cannot allow him to go into a car and get another weapon. So once he opens that door, they have to react, regardless of the consequences. Maybe he does have a knife on him, and they're going to get stabbed. But they, at this, at that point, it's an all-or-nothing thing, right? And as as we saw, the witness that took the video, the second video, said that they heard the officers yell, "Drop the knife!" Now, here's the thing: I don't believe everything I see or hear, right? Um, maybe the knife was was there. You know, maybe it was planted there after the fact. Who knows? I actually don't think it, it really matters here, except for the reason they didn't take him down. Um, the Kenosha police do not have body cams, so we're not going to see a video of it. The videos that we've seen are probably the best that we're going to get. But we are going to be able to hear audio of it. And as of right now, I have not heard that audio. I don't know if it's come out or not. Um, but I have to assume the way that the officers are treating the situation after the scuffle ensues that they have been told that he has a knife and that they are under the impression that he has a knife on his person and no one wants to re-engage him and get stabbed or hurt or injured. And so therefore they have guns drawn and they're waiting. Once he opens the car door, all bets are off. They have to engage him because, and we'll get to that in a second, but they have to engage him, and so they do. Um, I, I think about it this way. In this situation, there are only a few things that can happen. A couple of things that, and, and a couple of things that absolutely cannot happen. So there's only a couple of things, a couple of ways this can go, and a couple of things that cannot be allowed to happen, all right? One, the cops cannot just let this man walk away. Same thing with Richard Brooks. Right? When the cops get called, they have to resolve the situation. They aren't there to play nice. They are there to see the entire situation through to the end. Cops are called to go into dangerous situations, and they can't just walk away from that. Nor can they let a person with an arrest warrant out for, you know, warrant out for his arrest because of charges of sexual assault, trespassing, and disorderly conduct, just leave. Or even worse, uh, which would be number two, they cannot allow him to get behind the wheel or get to anything that is a potential weapon. And, and really, uh, the vehicle would be a potential weapon. 
You know, let's, here's the thing. Let's say Jacob Blake has snapped mentally, okay? And he's just gone. You know, he knows he's going to jail. And so he wants to get back into that car and run as many people over as he possibly can or crash it straight into the building and kill or hurt as many people as he can before he goes to jail. Let's say he has a gun. Let's say he has an Uzi sitting in the driver's side seat, right? And we're gonna get to the the reason um, that that might be a big deal here in a minute, other than the obvious. Um, but let's say he has a gun or as you know, reported a knife, and he doesn't care about the consequences anymore because he you know he's already headed to jail. What does he care? You know, what's the difference to him? He thinks that cop that has a hold of his shirt has to make a split second decision. And with that decision in mind, I want to enter into the mind of a cop for just a second, just a minute. Let's think about it. Let's think about the job of a cop for a minute. Okay. Like I said, this is obviously people are not going to like this, but you know, you got to look at, you got to get out of the mainstream media, the, the crap that you're just being pumped full of, right? A black man died. Let's freak out, right? Let's look at it for a second. Let's think about it in terms of what the cops are in the middle of, the situation that they're in the middle of, and what might be going through their head as to why they did these particular actions, okay? You know, here's the thing. With cops, these men and women are trained to go into situations that not a lot of people want to get in the middle of and to resolve that situation, bring that to an end. They are called when things get too out of hand, most of the time. They have come into a potentially dangerous situation. They have to do the right thing, say the right thing at all times, so as to de-escalate the problem or problems, so that everyone involved walks away safely. A lot of times, they have to make split-second judgments, and they have to decide who lives and who dies? And we, as citizens, we as the public, have given them authority, and I think rightly so. Because somebody has to be able, and I've said this before, right? Would you want to deal with Richard Books drunk at a Wendy's? All right, we're going to get into that next episode. We're going to really get into that a little bit more. But, you know, these cops have that authority. We as society have given them that authority, and I think it's it's justified. You know, I think the police force does what it's supposed to. You know, these men and women have to be. You know, again, we're going in the mind of a cop, right? These men and women have to be on alert throughout their entire shift, and when they get called to a situation, they have to go on high alert and end the situation if gunfire starts. They can't just run away. They have to stop that threat. When they show up to a call, they realize every time they may not walk away from that. They may not walk away from that situation, from that incident. That call that they're showing up to may be their last. Showing up to Richard Brooks, that may be their last call that they go on. Right? Showing up to Jacob Blake, that might be the last time, that day, that's the last time they saw their family, their friends. They, have, they know that every single time they show up to a call. That's what they're dealing with, right? In this case with Mr. Blake, he is reaching into a car after resisting arrest. Now let's get into what the officers nor you nor I know. This is this is what they don't know. Which is what anyone at any time is thinking. Most of us, as far as I know, can't read people's minds. Although there is that one no, I'm just joking. But you know, these officers can't read Jacob Blake's mind. The officers don't know what he's thinking or they they, they don't know what he's doing. He's not saying anything. And they, they obviously don't know what he intends to do. Now here's the thing, as, an, as a police officer uh, that is responsible for the safety of all of those people you see in the video, 
Not just themselves, not just Jacob Blake. Everybody in that video. There's quite a few people in that video. You can see it all, all over the place. Those police officers are responsible for the lives of all of those people. We've, we as a society have said you are responsible because you have the gun. You have the authority to kill someone. Right? And like I said, well, I'm going to get into that. Should we give them that authority and da 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 later on? But that's what they that's what they're that's their position. That's what they're dealing with. They're not there just to make sure Jacob Blake has a good day. They're there to resolve the situation. They're there they have to weigh the potential outcomes of every scenario given the facts as each new facts presents itself. The fact that Jacob Blake has told them he has a knife, as far as I understand right now, right? Those officers have prior knowledge that he has a knife on his person, or he has a knife. They believe it to be on his person. He has resisted arrest. He's up and about. Each new step, each new thing, they have to reevaluate the situation. And it's life and death evaluation. If they make the wrong move, somebody dies. Somebody gets hurt. A stray bullet can kill any one of those kids. You hear on the video, the passenger side, Mama, get away, get away from there. Mama, get out of that, right? The reason you hear that is because that has become a life and death situation because of the actions by Jacob Blake. Not anybody else, but because of his actions. Same thing with Rashard Brooks. Because of his actions, he has made that situation a life and death situation. Here's the thing. Cops basically, they have to determine if Jacob Blake is a threat with each new movement, each new action. You know, at the end of the day, I think that had anyone, including myself, been in that same situation, I think the result would have been the same. Resisting arrest, leaning into a car with windows so tinted that you can't see inside, cops with guns drawn you know I question the guy's mentality what did you think was going to happen I mean you know I think a lot of people seem to look at all this stuff as the movies you know oh well the cops you know they they draw they drew their guns but it doesn't really mean anything like you're facing down three or four cops with guns drawn on you Chances are highly likely if you don't do what you've been told, you're going to get shot, and it's quite possible you're going to die. Once you make the once a cop has made the decision to draw their weapon because they deem it necessary, there's only one of two ways that goes. You listen and you live, you don't and you die. Very simple equation. You know, really in this scenario, there are really only three things that could happen there. One, Blake gets into the car and does nothing. He gets in the car, just sits there, which is ridiculous, but maybe. Two, Blake gets in the car and leaves, and a car chase ensues. Can't have that. Are you serious? That's not going to happen, All right? Or three, Blake reaches inside the vehicle, gets a weapon, and hurts someone. None of those, thi those things can the cops afford. Cops can't let any of those things happen. Lastly, let's look at the fact that the Officer Shesky fired seven shots into Blake's back. And this is where we're going to get into maybe he has an Uzi in the seat, that kind of thing, right? Uh, is this excessive? The fact that he shot Blake seven times in the back, point blank range. Okay. Now remember, Blake... At this point is arm's length he's grabbed him you can see it on the video he's grabbed him by his shirt he's arm's length away and he fires seven shots right is this excessive let's think about it this way okay again i'm saying some things that people are just not going to agree with that's okay listen to what i'm talking about form your own opinion don't just get told by fox news cnn msnbc television stations whoever Right? Protests and marches and all. Don't just listen to that crap. Look at what is going on here and form your own opinion. 
As far as we know right now, as far as I know right now, Jacob Blake is going to live. Well, that's not beside the point. I'd like to point out what that means in the situation as it's unfolding. Okay? We all know about adrenaline. It can give people seemingly superhuman strength. Now, the reason I point this out is why the officer keeps firing into Blake's back. Remember, that officer Shesky is trying to stop Blake from doing anything else. Now, like, like I said, let's say he has an Uzi sitting in that driver's side seat. Nobody knows that. You have no idea what that guy has. What he intends to do, none of that. Let's see he has an automatic weapon. Something that can fire off, pop off shots like you wouldn't believe. And it's an Uzi, it's easy to get to, boom. He grabs it, right? You fire one bullet, that is not gonna stop that man from turning around and spraying everybody with an Uzi, with an automatic weapon, right? One bullet's not gonna do that. Two bullets are not gonna do that. Three bullets are not gonna do that. Unless you shoot him in the head and the heart. We're going to get to that. But firing one bullet into his stomach is not going to do that. It's not immediately going to stop him. That's what Officer Shesky is trying to do. Is stop him from doing anything else. That man has made that decision. You've made it into a life or death situation. That officer has no choice but to stop you. To put you down. Think about it this way. The body, when confronted with sudden trauma, goes into what's called a state of shock. Think about it when, in terms of when you, know, you break something or you sprain something. For instance, you sprain your ankle. It doesn't hurt. It might hurt a little bit, but your body takes a while. It starts swelling. That's what swelling is. When you break something and you have a traumatic event happen to you, you go into a state of shock. It takes a while for you that the realization of that to catch up. Same thing, right? When it goes to this particular situation, adrenaline's pumping. You shoot one shot, he may not even feel it. Not only that, but you don't know if he's on drugs. You don't know if he's on whatever. Maybe he's feeling superhuman. You don't know. You don't know any of those things. The only thing you know is that he has resisted arrest, he has worn out for his arrest, you're trying to arrest him, he's told you he has a weapon, he's going to either, he, he already has that on his person or he's going to get it, and you have to stop him. You have to, you have to stop him as a police officer. Like I said, one bullet does not accomplish the goal of immediate cease and desist. So, the officer keeps firing until he sees the reaction that he needs to see until he sees that man stop doing what he's doing he keeps firing here's a simple fact and i hope this gets pointed out i hope people understand this if if the man is arm's length away and you're trained going to shooting ranges and all these things do you not think that that officer could have easily easily killed jacob blake could have one bullet to the head done right that's way up here okay one bullet to the heart that's right here right if you're looking at the video your arm's length away you're firing at him point blank range you could have easily hit him in the head killed him could have easily hit him in the heart killed him but he didn't do that right he shot him in the abdomen right um Officer Shesky purposely aimed lower than the head, lower than the heart, towards the midsection of Blake in order to stop him immediately, but not to kill him. Now, despite what we see in the movies, it's a medical fact that if someone gets shot in the gut, they are much more likely to live and can survive much longer than anyone else, anywhere else in the upper body. This brings the question out of why not shoot him in the leg or shoot him in the arm again remember that officer Shesky is responsible for all of the lives of the people around him he is in the best position to do something about what Blake is doing and his duty 
is at that point, given the situation, to stop Blake. Not to fire a warning shot into his leg or arm, because that's all that would be at that particular moment. His job isn't to kill him either, right? He could have done so very easily. His job's not to kill him, but his job's not to warn him either. His job is to stop him. Bottom line to the most recent event that happened in Wisconsin is the officers did their duty. They protected everyone involved to the best of their ability, given the situation and how things played out. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are not going to agree with everything I've said here. You can call me a cop lover. You can call me whatever you want to. Just call me. No, I'm joking. Um, you can call me whatever you want to. But if you look at these, let's say, four events objectively, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, Rashard Brooks, and, and Jacob Blake, if you look at those... The only one we should really, I think, personally, the only one we should really have a problem with is George Floyd. And George Floyd's, that whole thing seems really odd to me. I think everything else is um, ridiculous. You know, I, I think these protests, I think all of these things. At the same time, here's the thing. I'll say this again. Black lives do matter. Right? I have no problem saying that. You know, black people are are in trouble right now as far as, you know, getting better communities. You know, they need help, man. You know, inner cities and these kind of things, they need help. You know, they don't need marches. I mean, what? that's the other thing. We're going to get to all these protests and... and um, there's actually been more violence in Kenosha. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to go into that right now, but there has been more violence. Two more people have been killed um, by a white male. Um, I, I don't really want to get into all that stuff. I want to stick to, you know, police versus um, versus these people. Um, you know, I, I really don't see as the police did anything wrong here. I, I think the police did their job. Um, I think the only problem that we have really was May 25th, 2020 with George Floyd, you know, um, that was uncalled for. It was horrible, horrific event that happened. Um, may, you know, may George Floyd rest in peace and, you know, uh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um. But I don't see why we're burning cities down. I, I don't understand why, you know, looting, rioting, and protesting, even protesting. We're going to get into that in the next episode um, on Tuesday. But, you know, I, I, I don't see the change. I, th I think it's like a song by Tupac called Changes. Um, you know, is anything ever going to change? I think protesting, stomping, and and screaming at the top of your lungs that things are unfair is going to do things? I, I'm not sure that it is. We're going to get into that in the next episode. Um, you know, in this episode, we talked about the problem. People getting killed by police. Um, black people getting killed by police. Uh, just now, at the very end, we've touched on the reaction uh, to this problem, the protests and these things. Uh, in the next episode, we'll get a bit deeper into the reactions um, to these events, and we'll try our best to get to a solution, a real, meaningful solution, change, real change. I hope that you haven't enjoyed this video, as this has been a hard one to do. Again, I feel it is necessary, though. It pains me to have to go through these events uh, just because it pains all of us to have to go through these events and uh, have these events be facts in our lives. Um, it sucks. It sucks that Breonna Taylor died. It sucks that uh, 
Rayshard Brooks died. It sucks that George Floyd died. It sucks that Trayvon Martin died. It sucks that, you know, there's there's all these people that are dying unnecessarily. You know, murder at the end of the day sucks. Even justified killing sucks. Nobody wants to live in that world. It's 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 where we're at. And like I said, I hope you haven't enjoyed this video because it sucks that we have to have this conversation. It sucks that we're going through this. Um, I do hope that you'll join me for the next episode on Tuesday. Uh, it's airing at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. And I want to ask you um, some favors. Uh, please, please pray for the families of Breonna Taylor, Kenneth Walker, George Floyd, Richard Brooks, and Jacob Blake. Please pray for officers Jonathan Mattingly, Brett Hankinson, Miles Cosgrove. They are the officers involved in the death of Breonna Taylor. Please pray for their families. Please pray for Officer Garrett Wolf, the officer involved with the death of Rayshard Brooks. And also please pray for his family as well. Please pray for Officer Derek Chauvin, Jay Alexander Kwong, Thomas Lang, and Tay Teao, the officers involved in the death of George Floyd. And please pray for all of their families. Please pray for Officer Rustin uh, Shaky. Uh, Shesky and also his family um, I say all this not because I'm on a side I say all this because of each of these events have a ripple effect both ways and those ripples touch each, each and every one of us the lives of the victims and their families that have been changed forever and the lives of the officers and their families that have been changed forever. You know, these deaths, these shootings, these killings are like ripping a hole in the, the fabric of these people's lives on both sides. The p person that pulled the trigger and the person that got killed. Um, and all of them need prayers. You know, Derek Chauvin's family, you know, all the families of all these officers that have had to deal with this, you know, that they, they have to deal with that, the consequences of a split second decision. Derek Chauvin killed somebody, George Floyd. You know, that's what we've been told, that's what we go on, but, you know, his family has to deal with that. So does he. You know, these events, these shootings, these deaths don't just affect the people involved. They truly do affect all of us. Those ripples hit each and every one of us. No matter if you watch the news or not, it's there. You know, something we have to deal with. Please pray for all these people involved. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening or watching. Wherever you may be or whoever you may be. I hope that you are safe. I hope that you are healthy. I hope that you can find something that makes you happy. And through it all, I hope you can still find a reason to smile. There are plenty of them. Remember yours and smile. As always and in always, may God bless you. Thanks. Gentlemen, boys and girls, the J J J Jared, the Jared Show.